So today uh, we have the privilege of interviewing professor, also uh, author, Carl Jurassi. Uh, I am Roger Kornberg and have known Carl since childhood. Uh, I knew him as a child, I knew him as a student in his laboratory, uh, and then I've had the privilege to know him as, as an adult, uh, which I have most of all enjoyed. And there are many things that uh, I'm dying to know about Carl's life, his career, his thoughts, uh, his opinions, his interests. Uh, and I'd like to begin by asking you, Carl, uh, why chemistry? How did you begin? How did you conceive an interest in chemistry? How did you pursue it? Uh, and what are your thoughts about that trajectory? That I think it's trajectory? like so many things in my life, <coughs> I was a complete coincidence. <coughs> I had no interest whatsoever as a kid in chemistry. I didn't have any chemical set at home. I didn't blow up any basement. Uh, both my parents were physicians, uh, <coughs> but in the, in the classical European sense of treating patients. <coughs> uh, in each case, their office was in the home. So I lived, you might say, in a, in, in a physician's uh, office and brought up as my parents divorced very early. Uh, my mother was, I was born in Vienna, uh, was Viennese, my father was Bulgarian, the mathematical school in Vienna, which at that time <coughs> was one of the greatest medical schools in the world. Uh, the <coughs> Austrian still think it, maybe with justification, was the, the greatest around 1900. Uh <coughs> uh, and um, I imagine staffed mainly by Jewish professors, most of whom were then banished. If they didn't die before. They didn't die before. Yeah, but that's absolutely true. Absolutely. And, and which has never been reconstructed. So I uh, lived there until age uh, 14 and essentially had no chemistry in school as yet. Although it's quite interesting because I went to the gymnasium, <coughs> you know, high school, it was four years grammar school, eight years gymnasium. So the first four years gymnasium. I had Latin from the first year and things like that. Math, chemistry, I may have had a little bit, but I don't remember. Anyway, it all had no impact on me. And I guess I assumed that I would probably go into medicine. Couldn't even think of anything else. But then, of course, the Nazis, an, uh, Nazi Anschluss came and we emigrated immediately. And my parents married again because my father uh, was Bulgarian and therefore came to Vienna, married my mother so she get a Bulgarian passport. We could leave immediately. And she went to London <coughs> to wait for an American visa, and I went with my father to Bulgaria and went to an American school there and learned English in Bulgaria. At what uh, age? 14? Uh, 14 and a half, uh, and so on. Went uh, for one and a half years to school in, in Bulgaria in a fabulous school called the American College. But of course, it's called the American College, but it was a high school. Uh, but that's an important point. That's something to do with chemistry. <coughs> um, and I then realized that um, getting good grades and doing well is critically important than, you know, if you have to flee a country and immigrate, it came without any, it came with $20. Uh, you know, my mother, with my mother, my father stayed in Bulgaria because he couldn't get a, <coughs> as a Bulgarian citizen, couldn't get in a <coughs> into the into United States. The, the Bulgarian quota was very different from the Austrian quota. But besides, there was no <coughs> obvious reason to leave Bulgaria, which was really not an anti-Semitic country or at that time no Nazi history. And uh, so we came here. My mother could not practice because she didn't have a license, so she worked as an assistant to a physician in upstate New York. <coughs> and I arrived <coughs> in December, and one of my American teachers in the American College in Sofia said, I have a friend at NYU, why don't you go there? And he'll give you advice where to go to school, meaning where should you do your last two years of, uh, of high school? Uh, and so I went there, but I had a cert my certificate, and of course I had a great advantage to the other refugees. It was in English. You know, everything was in English. So you didn't have to translate from German or whatever language was. So I went to this man in December, I still remember, just before Christmas at NYU, and <coughs> told him who I was and so on. He was very nice. He said, you know, I'm sorry, but we really can't take any students right now in December. Well, I immediately realized he thought 
that I came from an American college where I graduated and that I wanted to go to NYU, where in fact the reason why I came there was to find out where to do my last two years of high school. And I didn't let on. I didn't <laughs> let on. And he said, well, I'll tell you. I know someone at Newark Junior College in Newark, New Jersey. Why don't you go over there? Maybe they're willing to take you for a January uh, semester. And I did this without letting on and went there one week later to Newark, New Jersey, and this was Philip Roth country. I can tell you right now, at that time, Newark was exactly what Philip Roth has been writing about. And I <coughs> they took me immediately <coughs> because, you know, you the, gymnas old, the gymnasium, yes, the gymnasium was so much, uh, you know, so much more advanced uh, uh, than the high schools here, and I had first-class grades in Bulgaria at that time, yeah, and it was all in English. So <laughs> I never went to high school, never finished high school. I went to New York Junior College. Well, I immediately thought, you know, eventually I'll take a pre-med and I'll be going to medicine. But then I also realized that I need to transfer eventually to a four-year college. And I wrote a letter to Mrs. Roosevelt that again shows the naivete, you know. Dear Mrs. Roosevelt, I thought she was a queen of America because I need a room board and tuition <laughs> scholarship. <laughs> and she won't believe it, but I got an answer. I didn't get it from her but I got it from the <coughs> Institute of International Education. She sent it to them, and they wrote me a few months later, said, Dear Mr. Grassi, you have a room board and tuition scholarship in Tarkio College, Tarkio, Missouri, T-A-R-K-I-O. <coughs> Never heard of it. I, d I barely knew where, Tar where Missouri was, <coughs> but of course I went there. And that was then beginning my sophomore year in college. And I stayed there for only one semester, and that is a college that since then went bankrupt. But it is a college where Wallace Carruthers graduated, uh, inventor of uh, nylon. So there's an interesting chemical mm. thing, and he's certainly their most prestigious graduate. It's a very small <coughs> uh, Presbyterian school. And during the summer, I visited my mother in upstate New York and passed through Kenyon College in Gambia, Ohio. And I fell in love with that college and asked them whether I'd go there. And they offered me a room, board, and tuition scholarship. And I went to Kenyon, and that's where I really became a chemist. <coughs> Although I think I probably came, became a chemist even at Newark Junior College, because a man, there was only one, one person, a man named Nathan Washington, who then became professor at Queens, who taught chemistry there. And he uh, had to take freshman chemistry as a pre-med, <coughs> and I loved it. <coughs> but then when I went to Kenyon College, <coughs> it was a two-man chemistry department. But Kenyon was a small college, but a first-class college, the ten 10-man <coughs> English department, you know, that's where the Kenyon Review was published. This is where people like uh, <coughs> Robert Lowell were there, and uh, uh, John Crow Ransom was the chair, and Dr. Roth graduate, but I mean, places like this is a, a marvelous tradition in English. Did you become interested in literature at that time? Well, I always was, because I always read, you know, I was brought up, <coughs> the gymnasium instruction was really much more in the really humanities. Uh, that but did being a Kenyan influence that? Uh, I think it did, because I remember one of my favorite courses actually then was Victorian poetry. Furthermore, <coughs> Kenya at that time was a men's college full of, uh, of uh, fraternities. I didn't belong to any fraternity. And there was a small house called Douglas House, uh, which 10 students stayed. Nine of them were English majors. And these were the fanciest of the fancy English uh, guys who were way beyond fraternity jocks and so on, and I was sort of the token non-chemist, uh, non-English uh, major in Douglas House, which may also may have had something to do with it. But you know, I, I had this two-man chemistry department, uh, <coughs> Bayes Norton and a man named Coolidge, <coughs> who were absolutely first class, did undergraduate research there during this one and a half year that I was there. <coughs> Again, I was lucky it was during the war. I couldn't get into the army, it was 4F because of my <coughs> injured leg, and they had these expedited courses. You could go also during, during the summer, so I was finished before my 19th birthday, my, my 18th birthday. Uh, <coughs> uh, and uh, by that time, it took, it was I, I was a chemistry major. Of course, I took chemistry, biology, I took the pre-med curriculum, but I was a chemistry major who intended to go to medical school. Couldn't, of course, afford it. Had to go to work, and I, uh, look for a job in the pharmaceutical industry, most of which were in New Jersey at that time. And I remember looking at the, at the blotless 
uh, and calendars that the pharmaceutical companies sent to the physician because my mother worked at the physician's office. I wrote to all of them, <laughs> applying as a junior chemist, and Sieber, uh, that then became Sieber Geigen eventually in no uh, Novartis, <coughs> hired me. Uh, so I was, uh, it was in 19, late 1942, so it was, <coughs> just about uh, 19 years old, uh, I worked at SIBA and worked on antihistamines and worked with a senior chemist who took, accepted me as if I were his equal, a man named Charles Hutter, himself a refugee from Vienna. <coughs> and in that year, we discovered one of the first two antihistamines, pyribenzamine. The two first antihistamines were Benadryl and pyribenzamine. So there I was, I was on the patent, on the publication, after one year, and, you know, I was very, very stimulated and decided I couldn't afford to go to medical school anyway, and then got a scholarship, fellowship at the University of Wisconsin. Uh, <coughs> I wanted to then work in steroid field. Why? Even though I was working in antihistamine. Because I read this fabulous book by FISA, <coughs> The Chemistry of Natural Products Related to Financing, which eventually in second edition called steroids. This was a Bible steroid, one of the most brilliantly written monographs I've ever read. It really turned me on to steroid chemistry. It was <coughs> Louis Fieser. Louis Fieser from Harvard. Yeah. And I um, then looked around who did steroid research in American universities. There weren't many. And the University of Wisconsin was one where two young assistant professors, Bill Johnson and Al Wiles, worked oh, on total cool. synthesis and so I applied to them. I, I got this fellowship there. So what year are we speaking of now? We are now speaking 43. I graduated in college in 42, worked one year at, at CIBA, did the antihistamine work. 1943, went to graduate school at Wisconsin. And they offered me a, research, a WARF, Wisconsin Alumni Research Foundation Fellowship, so I didn't even have to do any teaching. I immediately went into research. And I remember going to Wilds. <coughs> they were both quite young, Johnson and and Bill Wiles, and, uh, and Al Wiles, and I said, well, I think I can get my PhD in two years, because it says <coughs> that you have to uh, do six semesters, and at that time I was still doing the war, you could also do it in the summer, so I said, it's two years. And he sort of smiled benignly and said, well, you know, you're talking about the legal aspects, but there's also a PhD thesis, et cetera, et cetera. But I got it in essentially two years. And what did you do during that time? And then I worked on steroids. I worked on a very tough problem, the conversion of <coughs> uh, the partial synthesis of estrogens from androgens. So basically you would say converting testosterone into estradiol, which chemical was a very tough problem. <coughs> and, uh, and you succeeded? Well, I had succeeded, and not only that, but you see, I had much more experience because I worked for one year as a junior chemist at SIBA. <coughs> I brought comatography to the University of Wisconsin. No one had ever comatographed. Well, we did I that mean. at SIBA because they really used it in Switzerland. This was a time when Rudzicka and Reichstein, these people were working yeah. and, and chromatography, column chromatography, was really central for that. I still remember <coughs> using, using a UV. Uh, there was no UV Beckman DU at the, in the chemistry department. There was one in chemical engineering and they permitted me to use the one in chemical engineering only if my professor accompanied me there and stood behind me as I was doing this point-by-point -point, uh, UV measurements. <coughs> but uh, it was, uh, but it was, and my best friend, Gilbert Stork, was, who became my best friend, was a graduate student there at the same time. <coughs> also with Johnson? Uh, no, he worked with McIlvain, and I worked with Wilds, but I oh. took organic chemistry courses with Bill Johnson, and of course, as you already know Bill so then Johnson. So 17 years later you joined Bill Johnson at Stanford, something yeah. like that. Yeah, well it was actually quite interesting. Bill Johnson, you know, by that time, <coughs> so I, I was, was at Wisconsin, and then I decided I'm gonna be a chemist. You know, I walked into chemistry with emphasis on medicinal chemistry, I organic understand. chemistry, medicinal chemistry, the yeah. biological things, and uh, I probably, even if I'd gone to medical school, I would have become the sort of physician that your father was, for instance, not treating patients, not the sort of thing that I would have become if I'd stayed in Vienna. If the Nazis hadn't come, there's no question I would have gone mm -hmm. medical school in Vienna, I would have become a practicing physician. Mm -hmm. So I really walked into chemistry uh, backwards, Definitely. and of course never 
I never regretted it without any question. But the interesting part, is, you know, I might as well just finish it. But so then Siba, who really appreciated me, treated me very well. They actually paid part of the fellowship in Wisconsin and immediately said, but come back after you get your PhD. And then I came back to Siba and worked for four years as a senior chemist at Siba, which was just one person in the lab. And that was just then when that explosion with cortisone occurred. But this Siba did all of their cortisone research, and they did a lot in Basel, in Switzerland, not at the American branch in Summit, New Jersey. So we were not permitted to work on this. And I really wanted to work on this. And then one day I got a letter from someone saying, would you like to come to Syntax in Mexico City? I never even heard of that. I've never been to Mexico. And, uh, and who wrote to you? Was it and Gerard? that was, was it, it was, was it really or Rosencrantz? No, no, Zaffaroni joined Syntax after I did. And Rosencrantz? Uh, it was George Rosencrantz. Uh, and, you know, I never heard of the place. It sounds like utter madness. But they said, come to Mexico for an interview trip. Well, you know, I was 26 at the time. I had already five years in industry, one before the PhD, four years afterwards. So I was a senior chemist with some experience. And they, I said, sure, why not go to Mexico? No, I mean, as a visit, I had no intention of going there. But uh, Rosencrantz absolutely charmed me. The idea of learning a new language, uh, you, you know, and I figured I'd spend a couple of years there. But what they wanted before was to try and work on synthesis of cortisone Which from what you had wanted to do. Well, that's what I wanted to do, and I can have assistance and so on. So I decided to do this. People thought I was utterly mad, utterly mad, because no one did any research at that time in Mexico. And then I stayed there for two years, and during those two years, it was perhaps the most productive years of my life because during these two, two years, Mark, you, uh, we published about 60 papers during yeah, that time. Yeah. We synthesized, were the first to synthesize cortisone in competition with Woodward at Harvard and Fieser at Harvard Amazing. and Tischler at Merck and the people at Oxford Amazing. and at ETH. And then four months later, synth and did the first synthesis of the oral contraceptive. I mean, this was really, and this was with young Mexican. Um, so this was chemists. you, did Rosen, was Rosenkranz also an organic chemist? Oh, absolutely. And did, did, it was did he work with, with Rosen, you? Or? It was Rosenkranz. Rosenkranz got his PhD with Rudicka at the ETH in Switzerland. In other words, he knew a and great And then he was in Mexico to escape from he Nazi He escaped, he was a Hungarian who escaped from, Hungarian Jew, who escaped from uh, Europe to Cuba. And it is the Mexican syntax uh, that's another story because a man named Russell Marker right. uh, <coughs> founded Syntex with these people in, in Mexico, and then he left a year later, and they needed a replacement, and they brought the Rosencrantz from Cuba to Mexico City, and he then brought me <coughs> uh, down and there. Then, and and then we, we stayed very good friends, and Alex Zaffaroni when did he join? joined a uh, few months later. He was also a chemist by training, right? He was a biochemist. Uh, yeah. Alex was a biochemist, got his PhD, an Uruguayan who got his PhD at the University of Rochester, and he worked at that time on paper chromatography. And paper chromatography was really quite important for another aspect of corticosteroid research, namely at that time, the other approach to corticosteroid synthesis at that time was through ad adrenal uh, infusions. And for that, you really wanted to analyze things with paper chromatography. So Alex Zaffaroni came there a few months later after I did to head a biochemistry department. So the three of us, uh, George Rosenkranz, Alex Zaffaroni, and I were in a way a trio, and we stayed friends now, well, since 1949, 1950. So that's 60 years, over 60 years. And then. Uh, the decision to move from Mexico City, Mexi was it Mexico City, to Palo Alto, was was motivated by what? what well, was no, there was an in between because I, of course, wanted to eventually go into university. Oh, so you you, you, and you wanted to leave in any case? Oh, I was going to leave in any. I left two years later, uh, in 1951, uh, because as a result of these publications and everything else, which and then of you course went to Wayne State. Wayne State University, they offered me then. And tenured, uh, uh, a tenured associate professorship. <coughs> you know, by that time I was, what was it, 28. <coughs> and uh, a year later promoted me to full professor. And it was, Wayne was a terrible department university in the context of physical facilities. 
but it was a first class place in terms of the university was really motivated to help and really were willing to spend money on physical instruments. Well, again, the chemistry was very cheap at that time. I mean, the most expensive thing was the DU, uh, was sure. the DU Beckman and the Baird infrared, and we had one of the first infrared. These were the only two physical instruments. Otherwise, it was basically hot plates and, and <laughs> test tubes <laughs> and Erlmeyer flasks. And blow your own glass and, and purify and your own reagents. Do your own analysis. And purify do your own, own reagents. Do your sure. own uh, elementary Look, there analysis. were no research yeah. grants then yeah. either. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, it's actually true. I sort of remember I got money because of my contract with industry. I got money from Merck, from Siba, and so on. And I remember my budget was about $15,000 or $20,000 a year, with which I had a research group of maybe Rather 12 people. Mm -hmm. And there was really... I'm sure that was a large budget for the time. Yes. Yeah. And, but so I was uh, then at Wayne State University and consulted for Syntax. So I flew oh, I down every few months, consulted, and then... Uh, when did Syntex move to Palo Alto? Well, that came out because of me. Uh, because I then I uh, had this, my knee injury, which now is, I can do it this way. I now have a completely stiff leg. You see, I could sit there like this all the time, and I could have some advertisement on my soul. You know, I'm going <laughs> to keep it down here. <coughs> uh, I was in such bad shape with my leg. At that time, it was not yet fused, but... <coughs> I was living on 24 aspirins a day. And then they concluded I'd have to be in braces and so on. And then persuaded me in Detroit while I was <coughs> professor at Wayne State that I need a knee fusion. And I decided on this and then told me that one of the greatest surgeons for knee fusion was a Mexican in Mexico City who himself had a knee fusion. And that convinced me. And so uh, my friends at Syntax interviewed him and then I arranged to go to Mexico or return as a vice president to Syntax, not a consultant, on leave of absence from Wayne and have my operation, which was six months in a cast, so I couldn't really move. But mm -hmm. I had my graduate students uh, in the state. I used to do the, have these monumental telephone, telephone calls. calls with all the students here, and it really worked. And then I, when it worked better, I <coughs> came back and forth between Wayne and Mexico, but stayed there for two years, and I was uh, going to return to Wayne State University because my condition was we got to get a new building, and they were willing to build a new building for me, and it was underway, and while it was underway, <coughs> Bill Johnson, my former professor... He moved to Stanford. No, he didn't move to Stanford yet. He came to me. <coughs> he was asked by Stanford, by Fred Terman, the legendary oh. provost, to be the head of the search committee for a new chair in the chemistry department. And he, wants, he wants to buy himself a new chemistry department, duplicate it, so to speak. And they looked for a chairman, and I still remember, and, and asked Bill to be the chair of the search committee, an outsider. And I still remember who, one of the person was Gutowski, the NMR mm -hmm. guy from yes. Illinois, but <coughs> he wanted too much money, apparently, and didn't come. And then they wanted, uh, I think it was Libya, Makes a difference. Again, someone they couldn't get. And then Terman turned apparently to Johnson and said, how about you? <coughs> Would you want to come to, to uh, uh, Stanford? But at that time, Bill Johnson would visit me in Mexico because he also gave some lectures there, wanted to bring me to Wisconsin. And he said, look, there's this business now at, at Stanford. How about this? Uh, go we together. go together to, to Stanford. And it does not work. Can you come to Wisconsin? Well, never, the Wisconsin thing never came up because the Stanford thing, and it worked very well because we did it. So Johnson told Terma that he only comes if I also get a professorship. So they had to deal with me separately. It was not as a package. We both knew we'd come together, but we decided we each have our mm -hmm. own conditions, which, of course, made it much more expensive. And the condition was well, we had to have a new building. Before, they were squawking at paying $50,000 for a new chair, and suddenly they had to have a new building, which cost them, I still remember, $800,000. And, uh, and Terman, <coughs> who was so convinced he wanted to do this, said, we'll do it in two or three months. He persuaded Stauffer, the Stauffer Chemical Company, to give him the money. <coughs> And the first building was the Stauffer Chemistry Building. But Bill and I both said, we only come when the building is up, <coughs> not until then. So I officially then joined Wisconsin and told Wayne, regretful I won't go back, which was unfair in a way because they treated me very well and were building a building there. 
but I stayed another year in Mexico and transferred my graduate students from Wayne in the meanwhile to Palo Alto, but I was not going to move until the building actually went up. So 1960 is when Bill Johnson and I arrived. And it was a building where <coughs> I had the ground floor because of my stiff leg, and Bill had the second floor. <coughs> and the following year, he decided to approach Paul Flory, you know, again, a Nobel laureate, subsequently, subsequently <coughs> to join. And he, he moved down into the basement. And, and the next Henry one was Talby Henry, Henry Talby the following year, Mark Connell, Ron Tamerlan. It was unbelievable. Yeah. Dick Holm, who then, however, went back to Harvard. Became a world-class In organic chemistry, it was really, yeah. and, and uh, Coleman from North sure. Carolina. And one of the best. Certainly, they, they well, used he, to say when I, was, when I was a graduate student in chemistry, which was some years later, they used to say it was uh, the second best chemistry department in the world after Harvard. But uh, Very good. I'm not sure that that would be a fair characterization. Very it good. was competitive. But it, it makes no difference whether the best or not. It was, it was one very of the top good. That the point is that in it became, years. in a short space of yeah. time, became Less a world class years. department. Mm -hmm. And I think, uh, but, uh, no question because of Bill. Bill, because he was head of the department. It was really, it was, it really showed the benefits of benevolent dictatorship yes. as compared to anything democratic. Because he basically could do this with Terman. He wanted to hire someone. He called Terman and said, you know, I'm going to try and get Flory, and I'm going to try and get Talby. It wasn't a search committee, and it wasn't a question of advertising it. So <coughs> then you moved Syntax after you moved to Stanford. No, no, I moved to Stanford, and then Syntax. Want, I, I continued as consultant. Actually, I was nominally a vice president of Syntax. And then Syntax, by that time, we, of course, had really, during the three years that I didn't mention, uh, when I was vice president with my stiff leg in Mexico City. We did all the work on corticosteroids, on topical corticosteroids and anabolics and so on, and developed a whole series of new of drugs. Sinalar. Market under our own name. And the answer was we have to f establish something in the United States. And they had intended at that time <coughs> to do it in New Jersey, which is where most people, and I said, do it in California. And I said, look, uh, you have some of the top universities there, you have top graduates there, and these poor people all have to go to New Jersey. If there were a pharmaceutical company to speak of on the West Coast, there was not. The only one was Cutter Labs, and this was not really a research organization. Uh, you, we really could do something. And uh, that's when we had only a five-man board of directors, and Rosenkranz and Zaffaroni were two. I was the third one, then we had a lawyer and a banker. So uh, they were easily convinced uh, to do it at Stanford. Uh, that was really why why uh, uh, Terman was so interested in getting me to Stanford, because he wanted to get something, some chemical present in the Stanford Industrial Park, which at that time was entirely electronics and... Uh, but now Zaffaroni and moved. Did Rosenkranz so then also Alexa move? No, and then Alex Zaffaroni decided he would move uh, with this and establish a branch in the United States. And then Rosenkranz remained in Ro Mexico. Rosenkranz remained there. We felt really very Mexican, but in the end, it was very interesting. All his three sons, Rosenkranz's son, went to, went to uh, came here to the United States, and uh, now then uh, to California and went to graduate school. But now then, at some point, you then moved from left Syntax and created a new company. Well, Zoacom, that was Zoacom, is that right? No, no, that came in between. What then happened a year later? Because on one other person, about the key person, was Joshua Lederberg. Because it was your father and Joshua Lederberg and Henry Kaplan, the three people who really were totally persuaded and said I should come to Stanford. You know, I was not convinced that Stanford was going to be necessarily the place to go to. This was not a hot chemistry department. It was a lovely place. But it was. They had uh, no chemistry department to speak of. But, yeah. well, yeah. But, but Terman said he's going to buy himself one. And he really did this. He met all the conditions. And uh, so then. The year after that, it was really with Josh. We said, "How about Syntex establishing a small place called Institute of Molecular Biology?" And we were probably the first pharmaceutical company in the United States before Roche, for instance, who then established their big place in Nutley, who really established an Institute of Molecular Biology. Okay. And uh, uh, I was running that uh, with uh, Josh Lederberg. And then uh, John Moffat, for instance, was John brought here, mm -hmm. and, uh, uh, and Boris Rotman, uh, and uh, 
we had that was the first instance. Then the day, the year after that, I said, well, we'll move some syntax research here, and Alex Zaffaroni was going to head this. And then I became really an operating vice president of that, but still doing this as a full-time professor at Stanford, because remember at Stanford, maybe even now, you could consult one day a week. Well, that's 52 days a week. And uh, since I'm a seven-day a week worker, I figured I didn't have to reduce anything at Stanford <laughs> to do this. And did this for a few years until, and Alex Zaffaroni was the president of Syntax Research, and then he left to form his own company, and I took over as president of Syntax Research. But that was when Terman really encouraged me to do this, and said, why don't you do this 50-50? Uh, and uh, so and that's when I decided. And you started at Stanford as a full time faculty. Oh, yeah. Oh, and I only later it changed. In 1960, uh, when Alex Zaffaroni left in 1968. Now, and just for my interest, the, during that period, after you arrived at Stanford and before 68, yeah. when this transition occurred, were you working on, on ORD, on optical rotatory dispersion? Oh, yeah. I was working on mass spectrometry. Actually, I sh ORD already started at. Uh, Wayne State, but then of course we went full blast at Stanford mm -hmm. and moved into circular dichroism. Uh, so, but it was the big new thing that did was mass spectrometry, optical rotor transversion, circular dichroism, and then uh, a lot of natural product chemistry, uh, chemistry of alkaloids, of terpenoids, of antibiotics. So, uh, <coughs> you know, we were the first ones to establish the structure of a macrolide antibiotic, uh, lefamycin. <coughs> And uh, then, uh, you know, that was, I had a large research group. It was, uh, it was a lot of fun. And all the teaching I did was graduate teaching, just like Bill Johnson did, because we were brought there to really upgrade the graduate PhD program. And uh, that was... Uh, so then when, when did uh, the move from Syntax to Zoocon occur? Well, in 1968, uh, yeah, actually, that's funny. I was, then it was a number of things at the same time was sort of absurd because at that time we were working at Syntax on uh, ectisome because that was, if you think about it, 1930s were really the explosion in, in um, vertebrate endocrinology with all the discovery of hormones on. The 1960s, really the explosion in insect, insect hormones. hormones. And this was first yeah. of all ecdysone and then juvenile hormone. And we really Are these also steroids? Pardon me? Are they also steroids? Ecdysone is a steroid, steroid right? the molting hormone. And we immediately brought in as consultants uh, some top people, Herbert Roller, uh, who was really the discoverer of the juvenile hormone from Wisconsin, and uh, and Williams, who was professor of biology at Harvard, mm. who did work on the juvenile hormone as consultants to Syntax, and decided to do that at Syntax. And then very quickly decided we'll form a separate company, and I decided to be there uh, and initially just did it on the side, and then decided in 1972, I'll leave Syntax and start Zoecon as a completely independent company and run it as CEO and chairman of the board. And because Syntax was getting quite large, and I really wanted to see what we can do it all over again, again on the Stanford Industrial Park. And uh, that turned out to be scientifically a wonderful thing. We were the first people to introduce the juvenile hormone in the insect control. We really educated the EPA uh, because they didn't have any experience in this, this new generation. Of these were insect growth regulators and not insecticides. Uh, you know, there are compounds in which you establish, could not establish uh, uh, the first product was established, you couldn't establish uh, um, LD50 because it was so non toxic. You know, this <laughs> is something that was a really basically a terpenoid that got biochemically degraded into carbon dioxide, acetic acid, and water. And uh, you couldn't really establish a classical toxicology because. By the time you gave gram quantities to the mice, they were just <laughs> came out <laughs> at the other <laughs> end without <laughs> killing them. And that turned out to be very exciting research. Uh, and then we formed another company. And that was, uh, that we first called it SINVAR. And again, I was the chairman of the board. Uh, and that was a joint venture with Syntax and Varian. And that's an interesting story because one of our colleagues at Stanford, uh, 
Bill Little. I don't know if he knew. He was a professor of yeah, yeah. physics, and I he had know. a fantastic yeah. theory of superconductivity, mm -hmm. uh, quite different from the other theories, where he really felt there were certain organic superconductors right. that uh, did not I exist. I was aware of that because Harvey McConnell got well. Hurt. Well, that's how we got Harvey McConnell involved, and so that was, and but they had to be m synthesized. They didn't exist. So he came to me as a professor in chemistry ah, and I said, uh, you know, how about, would you be interested in working on this? And I said, well, you know, A, it's not really my field, and second, I'm not sure, but, you know, I have an idea. Why don't we, the people who really, after all, could evaluate this with people at Varian. So why don't we do something jointly with syntax and Varian in this field? Uh, so I knew the people at Varian, uh, and uh, we had a meeting, and Alex Zaffaroni joined, and we decided to form a joint company, 50-50, called the Synvar Institute, which was put into the building where the Syntax Institute of Molecular Biology used to be, which oh, has then had moved into a bigger building. And we decided to do this again the same way, have just mostly postdoctorate fellows, but uh, have some consultants uh, from Stanford who would be during lunch come there, you know, we just have our lunch breaks there every day. And then Hart McConnell became one of them because he was interested in superconductivity, but in a very different context from uh, uh, the theory that Bill Little had. And okay. uh, so that uh, we hired a spectacular organic chemist, Ted Ullman, from the East Coast to become the technical director of that. And Ullman came and said he's only willing to work in this mad thing if we can also work on a third topic, which was his specialty, which was photochemistry. So we were starting out on photochemistry, and we were starting to work on Bill Little's uh, approach, which in the end did not work, and then work on McConnell's free radicals, who was interested in free stable free radicals. And that paid off enormously in terms of becoming a diagnostic method, actually for opiates in urine. This was during the Vietnam War, and then from one day to another, the U.S. Army decided to use that, what we developed, uh, that method, which was oh in uh, <coughs> electron spin resonance yes. method for detecting stable free radicals uh, for urine. And there were probably hundreds of thousands of American soldiers who were screened in, uh, in uh, Vietnam uh, with the ESR machine that flew over from Varian and uh, using the Sinvar thing. So that became, and then became a very successful company very quickly. And then we discovered that Sinvar, you know, the initials yes. of Syntax and Varian, uh, were, uh, were the trade name of a varnish company, a synthetic varnish company <laughs> in <laughs> Delaware who were not willing to sell us their name, so we changed it to Siva, S-Y-V-A. Oh, and that itself became a and Siva made Sinalar, is that right? Pardon me? Sinalar, the, uh, the very successful topical steroid? Yeah, but that was Syntex. That was Syntex, okay. Yeah. No, and Siva worked in a diagnostic field, so that was the diagnostic one. Uh, but that time I then left Syntex altogether. And, uh, and, and Zoicon had been sold? And Zoicon was flourishing, and Zoicon was acquired by Occidental Petroleum. And so I then became a president of a Occidental Petroleum subsidiary, but the Occidental Petroleum, after a few years, realized they didn't understand at all what we were doing, so they decided to sell it, <coughs> but didn't know how to sell it, so they asked us to sell ourselves, and we went around shopping, and uh, eventually found Sandoz, uh, the pharmaceutical company, who were very interested in new approaches to insect control, so we became the uh, insect branch of Sandoz. So then I was an employee partly of Sandoz, as chairman of the board of that subsidiary, and then Sandoz became Novartis. But by that time I had uh, left. And uh, where is Zoicon now? Zoicon is a part of that. It's still functioning. Well, it's it? but it's not under the name Zoicon anymore. And of course, but yeah. it's the, but that, but that, that, that research because direction is still Well, we, were, uh, we really developed uh, an extremely effective material for flea colors in, uh, in dogs and for cockroach control. You know, these were all then based on analogs of juvenile hormone, but making it much more powerful than a natural uh, juvenile hormone. In other words, exactly like human birth control, except you could say birth control for insects. You know, human birth control is based on the lead from progesterone. They're making a, an analog, a steroid that is not progesterone anymore, but 
has the same biological properties or are active. That was the basis of the pill. Well, in insects, the juvenile hormone uh, keeps insects at juvenile stage so they're never mature and could not reproduce. So after one generation, they, they would be gone. But uh, it decomposes so rapidly that the terpenoid gets degraded. It's very biodegradable, which is wonderful from an ecological standpoint, but very bad from an <coughs> uh, economic standpoint. That's where, of course, DDT and other things are so useful because they do not degrade rapidly. So we worked on, uh, on modifications of that, of compounds that turned out to be hundreds of times more active than the natural juvenile hormone and active for days rather than just uh, hours. <coughs> and that was good enough with certain formulations as mosquito control or cockroach control or flea control. Uh, in other words, these were public health uh, nuisances rather than agricultural uh, pests. And uh, that was a success of uh, Zoicom. We became the first company to get all these EPA approvals. And uh, even though they were not sold under the Zoicom name, all the flea colors in the United States at that time. And why not the agricultural application? Why has that not Because worked? on a practical standpoint, uh, for that uh, it would be too expensive because you would need uh, it would basically have to be sprayed. It'd have to stay around long enough. It would be too expensive. Ah, I see. Mm -hmm. w what is your, looking back um, and forward, what is your view of the state of uh, that kind of use of chemistry, also of the future of academic chemistry? Uh, I mean, you have a, an unusual perspective on the history of the subject, on its relationship to industry. Uh, it seems the pharmaceutical industry is in a troubled condition today uh, with uh, apparently no success in developing new pharmaceuticals, uh, where in contrast, I would say, with the extraordinarily creative career that you and your colleagues led in Syntex and in these other ventures. Uh, but we had it, <coughs> I think we had it, Syntex was successful uh, up to a certain stage. You know, in the end it was bought in 1992 and 1993 by another giant. But by that time, Syntec itself was a... Which destroyed it. which destroyed Which destroyed it. it. But you see, <coughs> even that is not fair. Syntex already in the 1992, 1993 was not anymore the company <coughs> that was before. Alex Zaffaroni had left to form his own company. And you had I had left, you might say, to form my, uh, the, my own company, our own company, Zoicom, because I think the problem with the pharmaceutical industry as such is not pharmaceutical industry that they have no ideas, that they're jerks or anything like that, which would be nonsense. But if you think about where the action now, or where was the action, let's say between 19, late 1980s to, to now, it was the bio, so-called biotech companies, the small companies which were flourishing all over, of which Syntex was a typical example. You could say that Syntex, in a way, was the, was first, the first biotech company. Yeah. It was even the first in that its Institute of Molecular Biology was the very first one. Sure. But in terms of, of mode of operation, Syntex was, exact, was run by scientists. It was done, the focus was on research, and uh, you didn't spend an extraordinary amount of time on the selling practices of the pharmaceutical industry, of which I disapprove enormously, always did. I mean, the way it is done <coughs> through <coughs> detail men and so on, the amount of money that's being spent in, in selling drugs, and the enormous amount of Me Too research. But it's a huge size of the companies, where, of course, then anymore, the small interaction doesn't work, it cannot work anymore. And you pay the penalty of huge sizes. And the really innovation, the Right. That, that needs a small, really needs a relative, uh, small, I don't mean a dozen people, but not really the 5,000, 10,000, 20,000 people. And so uh, but I, I understand what you're saying is what worked in the past is what's going to work in the future. Well, it, it really does, because in a way that is what do the large companies sure. doing? It is not that they don't have ideas, but the way they operate, they really cannot foster this type of right. uh, research. So what are they doing? They're buying these results from the small companies or and acquiring them. them, yes. So they're marketing but, organizations. But I really think it's the size part that is, uh, the issue. Uh, that has been, and of course it's not run by scientists anymore. That is the other really quite striking thing. The pharmaceutical company in the past were all run by scientists. Uh, Syntex was a good example. Uh, it was really until the 1980s. And then it became business people 
who, are, who ran the salespeople. And lawyers. Uh, if you look at the large company like Merck, well, Merck, uh, Vagelos was probably the last scientist who ran mm. it. But before that, it was uh, people like Randolph Major, Take Abbott, which was run by, um, uh, by a scientist, Lilly and so on, uh, Park Davis, way back. In other words, the, the history of the American pharmaceutical companies and certainly of the big ones in, in Europe where scientists were running them. Uh, this is not the case anymore. It is now because it becomes entirely business driven uh, and science, even though it is important, uh, plays financially and otherwise a relatively minor role. Well, Pfizer was run under the, under the ground, into the ground by lawyers. That's right. Who ran the company. And uh, the, I suppose in the end you trace the, the fault to the boards which are not scientists either and don't know better. Well, of course, it? they are appointed by, I mean, you know, boards are appointed in the end by management, uh, whether they like it or not. Sure. Or by no, But what struck me was the board of syntax, as you described it, you, Rosencrantz, and Zaffiron. Well, it was five people in the majority were the three scientists exactly. who all used, were at one stage or another research directors. Yeah. And so, as, you, as I've understood from you, and it's clearly the case, the, uh, the way peop people think and work hasn't changed, and so the same mechanism will be the only one that is uh, the generator of significant new pharmaceuticals it in is the now. future. It is now. It's a small company. And what about the state of academic chemistry? I mean, you, uh, after all, I mean, your primary career, when all well, of a sudden done, the state of academic chemistry uh, is, is a curious one. On the one hand, there's no question that chemistry is the central science. Here, here. Uh, there's absolutely no question. Your father, who was not a chemist, preached that gospel 30 years ago, I if not more than that. I evidently learned that, it very well. That, yeah. But there are other people, you know, if I take, for instance, uh, uh, Konrad Bloch. I've used an example. I often spoke to him about this because there. Conrad was a chemist. That's right, but then he certainly became a biochemist. Yes. So, but the point is, I think you cannot become a great, a significant biologist in the context of molecular biology or, or neurosciences or the cutting edge area. In other words, I'm not talking about the traditional biology uh, sure. without denigrating it, the standard botany and zoology. But uh, for the type of the biology that's really the driving force. Now, you have to know chemistry. And, know and it isn't just taking an organic chemistry course. I don't mean that. I mean, much of it, you could say, is chemistry, uh, if you wanted. And the fact that departments I, may I just such say, I always, pardon my interference, I always thought it struck me greatly that the, that the two uh, best physicists I know, uh, who knew, uh, knew and know, uh, Francis Crick and Aaron Klug, were actually brilliant chemists, and what they practiced in their <laughs> careers was chemistry. That's right. So it's to second and to support what you've but, just said. <coughs> but <coughs> it is very interesting if <coughs> I started my career all over again in sciences, <coughs> just the road over come, I would not become a chemist. I would not be a chemistry major. I and mean, we have very few chemistry majors. I'm surprised to hear you say that. We Why? have very few chemistry majors. I would study chemistry without any question. But my focus would be what eventually became anyway, because you think about it, pure chemistry is a discipline, but the really exciting parts of chemistry are, and that's what makes it central science, is a connection to, on the one hand, physics, material science, biology, you name it. <coughs> it is always the chemical, the collaboration between them. So the recognition of large chemistry departments like Harvard or Cornell, who even changed the title of their departments, in that case, with a focus on biology. But there are other places, I don't know, let's take Northwestern, that really focuses a great deal yes, right now on nanotechnology and so on. But again, I, I feel it is <coughs> you absolutely have to do a lot of chemical research, but the intellectual driving force, the ultimate aim is not necessarily the pure chemistry. It is that other. It's biology, material science, physics, you name which other area it is. You do chemistry, and you have to be first class in chemistry. But isn't there a risk? I mean, the risk is that it, the chemistry becomes superficial, but and there's a loss of no, the core discipline. No, I don't think it becomes superficial. It's just that it's called something else. I think it is just, uh, uh, and the reason why I think I'm 
go in the direction because I'm really quite critical of my own tribe. Chemistry is a tribe, you know, like any other. And I'm an insider of that tribe in that chemistry has departments in many places. And uh, Stanford is changing now, but much later than some others. It's built high walls around itself, even though it is an mm. interdisciplinary one. But is that and, new? And these uh, high walls, you either have to climb over them or you have to get some tunnels through this, but that it, yeah. instead of being wide open <coughs> and just having things flowing back and forth between chemistry, biology, material science, physics, and so on here. And there are still many chemists who are being trained in the image of the pure chemist and who feel that they're really oh, deserting their field if they become biochemist, biological chemist, uh, and whatever next thing, uh, immunology, <laughs> sure, <laughs> sure. geneticist, and so on, but uh, chemical genetics. I'm surprised to hear you say that because, I mean, that was once an indictment of chemistry departments especially as the very first vestiges or indications of what you said began to occur. But I thought nowadays that that had passed. and that It's passed in some places, but it has not passed in other places. And Stanford, and Stanford is an example where it hasn't? Well, Stanford is an in-between example in that we have faculty members uh, among the young ones. I think almost all fall into the category of that new discipline. But some of the... Uh, some of the veterans, and they will remain unnamed but here, do I know who uh, you in mean my that? opinion, uh, uh, are not that at all. Sure. And I'm critical in a, another way, although that's probably true also of many other scientists, but I, because I see more chemists feed here. I think uh, the, not the work ethics, but the mode of operation is one which really dehumanizes you. Uh, I, who have become a writer of fiction, of plays, but of intellectual ones, find that, to give you an example, among my colleagues, we have a department of 20-some people. Well, I would say maybe three, maximum four, have read the books that I've written, have gone to the plays that I've seen. If I, as a chemist, in if I were not an emeritus now, but still a chemist in my department, I learned one of my colleagues had written a play. I would go to the premiere. Oh if yeah. someone had told me he'd written a novel, I would want to read it uh, out of curiosity, if nothing else. That curiosity, cultural curiosity, absolutely does not exist. And it does not exist out of a very simple reason. Uh, we all workaholics, but workaholics now to an extent where and graduate students are trained that way. If you don't show up in the evening, if you don't show up uh, for weekends, uh, you know, it doesn't, uh, it doesn't cut. Uh, but, how, but I don't think the kind of narrow intellectual horizon to which you refer is limited to chemists. No, I, say I don't know exactly that, but I have to tell you, as I've now decided almost out of self-defense to spend more and more time in Europe, and I sort of commute triangularly, <coughs> San Francisco, London, and Vienna, I find there's much more reading, cultural exposure going on, certainly in Central Europe, in the German-speaking <coughs> areas, and there's an American, with probably the English somewhere in between. But I would say there's a striking difference, in my opinion, in, uh, in terms of, uh, of, uh, of that type of cultural engagement. And uh, intellectual interest or depth or what have you, but why, why is that? I mean well, it's, uh, it's complicated. Uh, in part, it is our, the nature of our high school education is still as compared to the gymnasium or the French mm -hmm. lycée. I mean, they're just, it's just much tougher uh, that, you know, they all have, let's say they all have calculus. But here, you know, say every high school student has calculus. You're lucky if some of them have no algebra, something like this. Any language? I mean, most of them uh, take a year of Spanish or, you know, sure. many high schools now they don't have any German, they don't have any French. You may have actually here in this area, maybe Chinese and, and Spanish. And there's nothing wrong with these, but it would be trivial. One year or two years. We are monolingual. I saw in my late wife, who was one of the most sophisticated women I knew, the professor of English, Diane Middlebrook, but she was monolingual. 
As am yeah. I. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm much to my regret. Yeah, but I'd say here that's that's impossible to find among right. the. Uh, but the reason for that in Europe is simple. I mean, if you're surrounded by it, I mean, if it's if the proximity to other languages is so close. Yeah, but you know, it isn't anymore. They, they used to be where the Hungarians spoke three languages. They don't anymore. Uh, they, uh, there are many Hungarians who don't speak German anymore. Used to be that, but English, of course, at the very least. Uh, and not because only it's English a second is a language, language for, for everybody. Not only lingua franca in science, but really in business and many for other everybody. things as well. Yeah. And it's taught in a very different way. If I look at a, at a graduate in an Austrian or a German uh, gymnasium, which I see now quite a number of students, I mean, their English is far, far superior to any Spanish or German or French or that Russian any American or Chinese acquires. that an American student would. Absolutely. I'd use it in that kind. Mathematics, the same thing. The amount of math they get in high school, except some very special ones, or and people take advanced training. But that's not the case. I think in that case it's we the are... the imperative of use. Well, that I, I think that I think is part of it. But from a cultural standpoint, I'll give you an example. If I'm... Well, I take London and Vienna, of course, but it could be Berlin, other places. Uh, or, you know, if you take Germany, although I don't really live in Germany, but, you know, almost every small town is a theater uh, because, of course, the government supports it. Uh, well, here, uh, I remember last year coming to San Francisco, which supposedly is this uh, sophisticated city, and I arrived on the 15th of uh, uh, December, and I am now a widow, and I want to do something myself before Christmas. I want to go to the theater. Well, there was a 15th, between the 15th and the 20-something of December, I tried ACT, the American Conservatory Theater, the Berkeley Rep, the Magic Theater. They're all closed. They're all closed for Christmas. You can go and buy tickets in January. And these or, else they're three playing, theaters. or else they're playing what they do every year, the Christmas Carol. Well, they don't, they don't, do, they don't the even do that anymore. Yeah. And then, or the you ballet know, only the opera, doesn't. The opera is closed. And the ballet is doing the Nutcracker you every could, year. Yeah, so you thing. could go to the symphony, and the symphony was sold out, but there's one symphony. Well, you know, if I'm talking about in Berlin, there are three opera companies. In Vienna, there are two or three of them. The main opera plays every day, every day, Saturday, Sunday, holidays, except for uh, July and August. Uh, nice. In London, you know, I could go to 27 plays in one day if I, if I wanted to at that time. So, I mean, that's, that permeates not just so-called cultural elitist myself, but at a really considerably lower level as well. At least the opportunities are there. The opportunities are not here. Yeah. I see, it, you know, I'm now teaching a, a, a Stanford seminar uh, than undergraduate, although there are even some graduate students, called Science in Theater. Well, where we really do, in a very sophisticated way, analyze certain plays that deal with science in part, and not just my, my own, but also others. And the first question that I ask these students, now these are elite students in an elite university. Most of them, not all of them, affluent and said, you know, what do you know about theater? How much have you gone to the theater? What you know? Well, you know, I would say half of them have never been to a theater. And those that have, you know, they've been to, uh, you know, I don't know, hair or, uh, sure. you know, some he, here and there you find one, but, but, but very few. And I suppose and you could say that the theater in New York is supported by tourists. <laughs> so even there. Yeah. But <laughs> yeah. So no. I'm, I'm unhappy about this. Yeah, no, I, but I don't know what the solution is. I mean, certainly it's a failure of the system of education, but it's also connects to tradition. I mean, in Europe and in Central Europe especially, you know, I think what you're speaking of is something that has roots that go far back. I don't know how you establish them. Let me, uh, because we have to conclude at some point, and in that regard, uh, ask you about uh, something else on, on which I think you have a, a very un probably a unique perspective. I mean, you've written, you created a genre of literature that uh, draws upon your experience in life as a scientist and especially upon the, as it were, the human side and the, uh, hu the personal interactions, the politics, the science, and so forth. But now you have also got a window on another human activity which is inevitably also political in nature and which has all of that that goes along namely the literary world, uh, what has it been like for you <laughs> to uh, penetrate and to try and become uh, a personage in that world? It's very tough. <coughs> it's very tough. But it's tough, in its, uh, and it'll be ironic, same sense as I found it also in chemistry, <coughs> because I have been successful in chemistry in terms of criteria 
and I don't mean just quantity where I've overdone it, no question, but in quality that I've done some important <coughs> things. And I, I don't have to brag. <coughs> I think they've had an effect on my discipline. And yet I've always in chemistry been an outsider, no question. Not a self-appointed outsider, but treated as an outsider. <coughs> so I mentioned I'm, you know, I'm a well-known organic chemist, and I've spoken in many places all over the world, still do. <coughs> but for instance, we have so-called organic symposia, the division of organic chemistry of the American Chemical Society. That is the <coughs> professional section of the discipline in which I'm working. They have annual symposia, <coughs> uh, people, there are obviously a dozen people speaking at them. Uh, colleagues of mine have spoken there sometimes, maybe during the lifetime a dozen times. Well, I've been invited once, and that was in 1958, before I even came to Stanford, which I find both shocking <coughs> and in, in some respect not only uh, dismissive but uh, disgusting. <coughs> but it is also typical because, you know, I worked in areas of chemistry which were in between. I worked a lot on physical methods of organic chemistry and I've had a real impact in things like <coughs> optical rotor dispersion, circular dichroism, mass spectrometry, things like this, you know, that had methodological advances. <coughs> I did a lot of work on natural particles chemistry which was not fashionable in the United States, which first was physical organic chemistry and then synthetic organic chemistry <coughs> until about 10, 20, 15 years ago. Uh, now go into literature. I've written now nine plays and they've cumulatively been translated into 20 languages. Well, that's a lot for someone who only started playwriting 15 years ago. And yet the most theater people can treat me totally as an outsider they always start out in programs, announcement, the chemist who is now coming there, but that always means, look, they're now butting into our field. Uh, there is no review of any novel of mine which doesn't always start first referring to me as a chemist who did certain chemical things, and the underlying thing is they are okay, so, but maybe he should have stayed in chemistry, and why does he come into our field? Why doesn't he follow our rules? because they are, in fact, rules of the game. Uh, and one of these rules is under no condition, under absolute no condition, should there be even a whiff of any didactive motive in fiction writing or in plays. But in fact, <coughs> you can go back to the Greeks, and there, there's plenty of didactive motive. Horace was the first one who even said you should both be able to teach and amuse people at the same time. Mm -hmm. Well, I went into, into literature first in the fiction and then theater, not only to satisfy myself intellectually and do something else, but because I wanted to become an intellectual smuggler. I wanted to really try yeah. and communicate with the general public about issues that deal with science that scientists themselves <coughs> either don't know much about because they don't spend much time mm. talking about the behavior and culture of their own tribal culture, or they don't have the time, take the time to really talk to the general public. Uh, you know, the general public can't do anything for us. We don't get any brownie points for that in the country. You'll never get tenure if you're a young assistant professor and you spend your time talking to the public. Absolutely. There are senior people like Carl Sagan who learned that lesson, uh, you know, never got elected to the National Academy because it was so popular on TV and so on in a very effective way, but it was held against him by many people. I was at the meeting of the National Academy where he was blacklisted when uh, he would have uh, gotten elected. And some colleagues, including a very well-known chemist, got up and said, why should we give him that? And, you know, he eventually then did not become a member of the National Academy. I'm giving you an example of that here. Uh, <coughs> so I decided that the genre that I really worked on is called science in fiction to differentiate completely from science fiction. So everything I describe is real, is, uh, is plausible, and uh, even has living scientists as minor characters under their name. I'll give you an example. Hart McConnell is in one. I bet you that Hart does not know to this day that he <coughs> is in one of my novels. I'm sure not. Because I think Hart doesn't read fiction. Uh, but I'm giving you the example. I'll give you the opposite example because it's not true of everyone. <coughs> uh, in my first novel, <coughs> which is still in print, it's, I don't know, in its 28th or 29th print on Cantor's Dilemma. Well, it's, it's a novel that we talks about academia, about the problem in academia. 
I wrote it for general public, but it now the reason why it's still living, so it's used in universities and colleges for courses that we didn't use to teach. Uh, ethics and research, sociology of science, science, mm. technology, and, uh, and uh, society, and things like this. Well, in it, I, and I invariably talk about women. I talk about the role of women in male-dominated disciplines. I used to teach in our feminist studies program. I feel very strongly about this. So the main character in this one is a woman gets her PhD, and then she goes on interview trip, and she goes to Harvard, and she goes to Caltech uh, to interview. And I describe as she goes there, and she gets interviewed by George Whitesides and by, uh, <coughs> by E.J. Corey, and she goes to Caltech and gets interviewed by Harry Gray and <coughs> Jack Robertson. So I mention them the name because I don't malign them. I even take a biochemist, Maxine Singer, you know, <coughs> and sure. talk about her son. Well, you know, I call him Gabler instead of Singer, but <laughs> it's the same one. I have Zaffaroni in a novel, but I call him Zaffanori. And uh, uh, Zafaroni <laughs> is a Uruguay, and my in the novel is Zafanori a Paraguayan. But you know, everyone knows who we're talking about in this case here. Well, to give an example, so my character decides to accept a, pr a tenure, uh, tenure track position in the chemistry department, Caltech, and turns it down at Harvard. Why? Because at that time when I wrote this, Harvard was very unfriendly to women, and Caltech already had started to make a real effort. And I say that. I mm -hmm. see no reason why I should hide this. This is not incidentally true anymore with Harvard. But at that time, there was no woman faculty member. This was now uh, 1990, roughly, at, uh, at Harvard. Well, <coughs> because it's an amusing story. Uh, so I have Harry Gray there, and she goes to eventually to Caltech in my novel. Three months after this book came out, and essentially no chemist ever wrote to me about the book, I get a letter from Harry Gray. Oh, I need to mention, and I have also a woman in there called Paula Curry, who is a non-scientist, because I always need some non-scientist to whom my scientists can explain the science, which of sure. course is the general public, but I need to use that as, as my didactic yeah. uh, uh, oper operation. Uh, so he writes, and she's a cello player and a very attractive woman <coughs> in my novel. And Harry Gray writes to me three months after the novel comes out, says, Dear Carl, I've just read Cantor's Dilemma. How can I meet Paula Curry? <laughs> so you see, that was to me one of the most wonderful letters because it showed he, he actually had read it and he focused on something attractive in there, yet he got Very the message clever. also across. In there. I'm using an example. Very clever. It's happened also in some plays of mine. And the same thing with plays. I feel very strongly that one can get, <coughs> one can do, well, a good example is a play called Oxygen, which I wrote, uh, wrote with another chemist, Roald Hoffman, <coughs> a very distinguished chemist, Nobel laureate from Cornell. Well, that's a play that deals with the discovery of oxygen, but also with centenary of the Nobel Prize. And really the juggling and manipulation for Nobel Prizes. And uh, goes back and forth between 1777 and 2001. Uh, 2001 was the centenary of the Nobel Prize. And part of the action is in the Nobel Committee. And we both know what is going on in the Nobel Committee because we both happen to be foreign members of the Swedish Academy. So the one privilege you have is you can not only nominate people for the Nobel Prize, you could actually be present at the session, although you cannot vote. Uh, <coughs> and, uh, well, that has been translated now into 17 languages. This year it was translated into Catalan. Well, and yet, major theaters would not, they would still gently poo-poo it, although the BBC broadcast on the World Service and, uh, you know, other uh, broadcasting companies. But here it's, uh, uh, the NPR did not do it. Uh, it's it's uh, it's a mixed bag, and it is not I easy. Understand. And you get and the trouble is that, as a writer, player, and so on, you're subject. That's part of the game, to critiques, to professional reviewers. We don't have this in science. In the end, that cannot happen to you in science. In science, uh, really, a paper is either good or bad, important or unimportant. And even if the referee wants to screw you, but another one won't. And even if some journal editor says, no, you always find a journal to do this, you know, in some extreme important sure. things. Uh, uh, At a certain level, it's ultimately objective. Yeah, 
ultimately, mm. the results will make it. Yes, uh, and literature is another uh, story. Nevertheless, so, it but, seems but that is not true in uh, not true there because they're relative matter anyway, and there you can really get shafted. But if I may say, having gone, your first novel having gone through twenty eight <laughs> printings, and with so many of your works having been published in so many languages, one can hardly count it for uh, your career in literature anything less than a, a remarkable success. Yes, it is in many respects, but not in the conventional respects I understand. of it. You know, I write long sellers, I do not write bestsellers. And you know, to people a real successful writer is Daniel Steele. I have not read anything of Daniel Steele, so it would be unfair to critique it. But you know, uh, but she is, she writes romantic uh, stuff. It's not my cup of so tea. She wouldn't want to write but anyway. she's a very, you know, millions of people read at hers, and in my case, it would be tens of thousands of and people. And is she any better respected by the literary community than you? Well, Maybe yeah. not. Maybe well, even less so. Well, yeah, that's <laughs> Maybe less. That's a different community. Yeah. So let me uh, say by way of conclusion that it's a pity we can't go on uh, for many hours, but it's been for me an un both remarkably informative and an enormous pleasure, and I can only uh, wish you uh, on what may be the uh, Eve of or shortly after your 88th birthday. Uh, Did you say 80 or 88? 88. It, you are now I 88. I wish you had said 80, but it's 88, yes. Mm -hmm. So I can only uh, wish you what a well known Hebrew expression that I'm sure you've heard, Ad May of Esrim, uh, may you continue to 120. Thank you, Carl. Well, it was a pleasure to, as you know, <coughs> to do it with you. I it was a good have reason to meet, uh, to get together again. Fascinating. Mm -hmm. Absolutely wonderful. Amazing, eh? What an incredible story.